What's up, YouTube? It is your boy, JB, and I am here today with the review for Life Out the Lockup Season 3, Episode 12, titled Three's a Crowd, you guys. This was the mid-season finale, and um, it'll be back in November once we wrap up with the other couples that we have on Love Out the Lockup. So, you guys, without further ado, let's go ahead and just jump into this episode review, shall we? Maybe not. All right, you guys, so I'm going to start up with the couple that annoyed me the most in this episode, and that's going to be, you guessed it, Sarah and Michael. So, you guys remember in last week's episode, it was the child's party. And even in the first part of my note, it says this shit here is blowing me. So, remember, Sarah and Michael were arguing outside in the parking lot. So Michael eventually did go inside and, you know, Aviana, the baby, the oldest one, actually, it's, it's really sad to me to see, you know, she just gravitated immediately to her dad. And it's just like, you've got to be a truly fucked up individual to not want to be, I mean, I'm not, actually, yes, I can say Michael doesn't actively try to be a part of his daughter's lives. Because any man that's going to fly to, he flew to Texas to see Megan, he went to, Miami with old ass Maria, your kids are not a number one priority for you. So you can say whatever you want to say, but I disagree. Um, so then he, you know, he wants to go and hold the baby rain. He held her for a few minutes and immediately when he started, when he um, got her, that baby started screaming, that baby started crying. You could hear her crying. And then when they sat down, she just wailed. And then Michael got up and walked out. So Sarah falling behind him. Like, ask him, like, yo, what's up, Michael? Like, why are you leaving? So Michael wants to say that, um, you know, it's very selfish of Sarah to have her boyfriend there. I'm like, that ain't got shit to do with the price of tea in China, Michael, right about now. You are supposed to be here for your daughter's birthday. You're not here for Malcolm. If you are, if you are in fact, actually here for your daughter's birthday, then say, you know, forget Sarah and her boyfriend. I'm here for my kids and leave it at that. But no, he wants to make this whole big ass scene. And it just really annoyed me, to be quite honest with you. Like, come to the party and be here for your child. You didn't come here for, did you come here, for, you know, for Sarah and her dude? You and your feelings that Sarah is not still hung up on your ass and she's moving the fuck on. That's what your issue is, Michael. Like, for real. Like, you focus on Malcolm, but it didn't seem like Malcolm was focused on you. Because Sarah even asked Malcolm, did he speak to you? And Malcolm said he did not. So you walked in there, you didn't speak to the man. Leave it at that. Don't speak to him. You could have told Sarah in the parking lot, like, yo, Sarah, I get that you said your man is here, but I don't want to have anything to do with him. This ain't the time or the place for me to sit down, have a conversation with homie and left it at that. But no, Michael is, you know, in his feelings and just really annoying, to, to be honest with you guys. Um... So then we, like I said, Michael left. So Michael called his dad. Sarah went back into the party. She's talking to Malcolm. And um, she's telling Malcolm what happened outside with um, Michael. So then, you know, he called, like I said, Michael left. He called his dad. And, you know, his dad is telling him that he handled the situation well. I'm like, no, he did not. He handled that situation terribly. A real grown ass man would have sat there you know, enjoyed his time with his daughters, said forget Sarah and her boyfriend, and, and, and left it at that. But no, Michael had to be like a child and walk out and make it all about him instead of it being about his daughters. So you calling Sarah selfish? Actually, Michael, you're the selfish one, not Sarah. So miss me with the bullshit. And then he's telling his dad that he know he, he gonna go pick up his girls. His daddy said, don't do that. You might want to call Sarah before you go over. And I'm like, exactly. Sarah can scream, white woman, white woman, white woman, and have you arrested. Get the fuck out of here, Michael. Like, Michael is childish as fuck. So then later in the episode, you know, Sarah and, and Malcolm, they at her house. Malcolm just wants to know what that was because, you know, you see her get so upset and heated. Like, someone who does that obviously still has feelings for the person. And yes, they have kids with each other, but if, you know, me and you are in a relationship, I need to make sure that I'm not going to get played and hurt and you go back to this dude. And Sarah says, no, you know, I'm over Michael 
I love you. I'm falling more in love with you each and every day. So then Michael calls Sarah, like his dad suggested. He does. He do. So when he called her, Michael is selling some bullshit about the bullshit about uh, Malcolm. And I'm sitting here once again saying to myself, why are you putting this all on Malcolm? If you, in fact, went there for your daughter's birthday to spend time with your daughters. Forget this dude. You could have told Sarah. But see, the thing is, you could have actually answered the phone when Sarah was calling you. You could have, you know, went through the plan like that you guys were supposed to meet up a few days before the party. Like, you could have done a lot of things, Michael. So you're trying to blame this on Sarah, but at this point, no blame is on Sarah for my part. And then, you know, um, he told her he's going to come over there. She's like, you can't come. Don't come over, Michael, because Malcolm is still here. I don't want no shit. Like, just stay where you are. And you can come see them tomorrow. Oh, no, I'm coming tonight. And, I, and you know, when I get there, the door better open. What you going to do, Michael? What are you going to do? Michael is so draining and annoying, but I'm going to move on, you guys, because I'm tired of talking about them already. More so specifically, Michael. Let's move on to the next couple that got on my nerves, and it really is it's never this person. It's never Lamar that gets on my nerves. It's always Andrea. So we see them, they're getting ready for this bootleg-ass um, baptismal. And I'm not judging baptismals or nothing like that. I'm just judging them. I'm not even judging the Mormon church. I just don't understand Andrea being a part of the Mormon church when Mormons didn't feature black people for a very long time. So that's my confusion because I'm all here for baptismals. I was baptized when I was, what, four years old at my church in the pool because actually the funny thing is <laughs> My church, I didn't realize it at the time, but my church was a mega church. But it wasn't like, it wasn't what today's mega churches are. It's, it was different. It was a lot of people in the, in the church, but everybody knew each other because actually, everybody knew each other because I'm from a small town. You know, the pastor knew everybody. It wasn't like, you know, a business. It wasn't a business as it is these days. It was just a regular, just a big super church. And we had a pool, and I remember I remember my baptismal to this day because I the one thing is I hate wet clothes, and I had to immediately my mama knew that once you know we baptized me in them clothes, she, you would have to change my clothes because I'm not gonna sit in some wet clothes. So I remember my baptismal. So Lamar and um, Tennyson, so they're outside, you know, they talking about the baptismal. I you know it's so funny. I feel like, you know, Andrea wants to say that, you know, she made a big sacrifice, you know, she um, sacrificed moving from Utah to California, which, okay, I understand that. But I feel like Lamar is making the biggest sacrifice because you have an issue with his family. You complain about where you guys live, and then you don't want him to have any kind of input on this, on the, like, the religion. My problem with Andrea is the fact that you had sex with him in a broom closet and got pregnant. Would the Mormon church look down on, upon you for doing that kind of shit? Like, that's my problem with Andrea. She's just a hypocrite. God. So L Lamar told Tennyson to watch the pool that they were blowing up. So he went inside, and when they went inside, whoop, that pool went flying. And then it got a big ass hole in it. So Lamar had to call Andrea and tell her what happened. She comes back and she's flipping the hell out. I'm like, Andrea. Girl, it ain't that deep. It is not that deep. Talking about, you know, that's the devil, and, you know, if she doesn't get baptized, you, you're just saying our daughter can go to hell. Girl, what? Andrea needs a therapist. So then we see this priest holder. That man looked creepy -er than hell to me. Actually, this whole thing is... is Again, it's not the fact that they're Mormon. I mean, it's not the fact that they're, it, it is the fact that they're Mormon. It's not the baptismal that bothers me. It's just this whole situation of her being a Mormon. I don't understand it. I've never saw a black Mormon in my life. So it's very interesting. But um, yeah. So then, you know, she's on the phone with her friends because Dulo and Dulo showed up. So she told her friends about Dulo offering Tennyson the weed. And I'm like, once again, Andre, it just was not that fucking deep. So she told him, well, I'm going to go disinvite him. There's an unwanted, unwelcome guest, and I'm about to go disinvite him. So she went downstairs and had a conversation with Dulo. I'm not going to talk about that conversation because, you know, she was talking about what well, Dulo is high right now. 
And Dulos said it was just a joke. I, I do believe it was a joke. It could have been, he, hell, he could have been serious, but even if he was joking or serious, Tennyson is 18, Andrea. You can't tell that young man what he can and cannot do, but yeah, whatever. So then we do see the, you know, like in my notes it says, uh, ex Andrea exaggerates shit. And I was really thrown back when I saw that Kente cloth on that. Um, and I'm like, oh, so you do know that you black. Okay. Hello. Welcome to being black. It's just something off about her. We're moving on. All right, you guys, let's discuss Brittany and um, her situation. This might be pretty quick. So you guys remember last week they went to the um, house and the mama was there with that whatever that was on her, that burn mark on her nose. I'm like, girl, what kind of drugs are you doing? So they said she was doing pills. Now she kept sitting there saying that she wasn't on anything, but I'm like, ma'am, you are seriously tweaking out. You on something. I don't know what it is, but you are definitely on something. And so she finally admits that she um, was on drugs. And I think the daughter said she took $120 something dollars out of her account. What? What kind of drugs did you buy for that kind? Damn. Do I need to be a drug dealer? No, I don't. Mm -mm. I'm just joking. These are jokes. I would say my jokes, not her jokes. But yeah, she's talking about she was in pain. Why didn't you just go to the doctor? Oh, okay. Maybe the doctor wasn't going to give you drugs because you're an alcohol, you know, a drug addict. <sighs> yeah. So then we see Brittany and she's having a talk with her sister. And the mom was just cussing. First of all, the mom was cussing him out. She told Brittany, fuck you. I'm like, damn. Tell her how you really feel. So Brittany was talking to the sister. She's telling the sister that, you know, she just feels like she needs to go to Alaska. And the sister is talking about the fact that you know, she's 21 years old. She This is her first apartment, I'm assuming. She doesn't want a broken lease or an eviction. And she doesn't want to leave her furniture. Now, I was with Brittany on the whole thing of furniture. You can replace that. That's easy. That's easy to replace. But now, when Brittany was talking about, you know, because she got a record that follows her, I'm like, and that should be a lesson. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I, I was in agreement with the sister, little sister. I, I agreed with her. 1,000% on this whole thing of I don't want an eviction on my record and I don't want a broken lease because I have I, I don't have an eviction never had an eviction but I do have a broken lease which actually the broken lease didn't show up because they put me in a bad situation with my apartment my very first apartment if you guys go back and watch like my Love and Hip Hop Miami the first review the first reviews that I did for Love and Hip Hop that was my first apartment and that apartment had mold growing in the vents. The, the mold was growing in the vents. I didn't know if I didn't know it for like the first month that I lived in that apartment. And you know, um, I was looking at my nightstand in my room. I was looking at my nightstand, and I, it was a lot of stuff in my room that I was looking at, and I'm like, "This has mold on it." I'm like, "Where did the mold come from?" I can never figure. I can never find out where the mold came from. So I would just wipe it off, and then I go back a few weeks later, and the mold is, I'm like, where in the hell is this mold coming from? It was in my bedroom. It was in my bathroom. It was in the living room. So then I found something told me to look at the vent, and there the mold was just growing out of the vent. And I told them about that. They said, oh, we're going to come out and treat it. I'm like, cool. And actually, I had to wait a whole weekend before they treated it. Then I'm like, okay. They were like, well, we treat it. I'm like, okay, cool. It's done. I don't have to worry about it no more. Whoop. Another month later, it grew back again. Needless to say, it grew back. It kept growing and it kept growing. And I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. If y'all not going to move me out of this apartment, I'm going to move out my damn self. But yeah, I mean, I understood, I understood where the sister came from. And that's actually why I think that the broken lease doesn't show up on, my, on me because I took pictures of the mold. And I emailed it to the corporate office and said, because they tried to hit me with a charge. I'm like, I'm not paying that because you guys had me living in unsafe conditions. And I sent them all the emails and they zeroed that account out. Never heard anything else from them. But yeah, let's move on, you guys. Um, also, I want to say one thing about them. That backyard is so nice. I think at this point, Brittany just needs to wash her hands with her mom and be done and, and just call it a wrap. Like, your mama got to be the one that wants to get the help. If she doesn't want to get the help, 
that's on her. But let's move on. This is actually longer than what I expected it to be. All right, you guys, and then let's discuss Shane and Lacey. So Lacey and Shane, they're at the OBGYN. And, you know, they just want to know if they're going to have one baby or two babies. And, you know, um, so I'm going to stop with the ex, um, with, the, with her voice because this, this is actually a good episode and a good for those two. Um, with, you know, Shane, I understood him a little bit more this episode when he was talking about his mom being on drugs and he was never really, he didn't grow up with his family. I understood him in that sense. But I still feel like, you know, um, I still feel like Shane, I feel like they should have waited a little bit, a little bit. Like maybe put your eggs on, you know, do the, in, maybe do the process of in vitro. Like, you know, fertilize the egg and sperm and, you know, just have your egg and sperm together. So that way, if you guys do want to have a baby at some point, do that. Because I don't necessarily feel that they're both ready for a baby. And that's just my personal opinion, just from looking at the show. I feel like there's, they, I feel like they definitely need to grow a little bit more with each other. They've only, what they, I don't even know if they've been together a year at this point. So I think that they just need to kind of grow and, you know, you know, deal with the three kids that they already have before adding another child to the situation. And I'm not saying that, you know, you're never at a point where you're 100% ready to have a child. But I don't think that these two are even really 17% ready to have a child. And that's just from the viewer's standpoint, from me looking at them. I just feel like they should have, you know, you know, did start the process of IVF. Like, you know, take her egg and his sperm and just freeze it. You know, create the embryo and just freeze the embryo until they're at a great spot in their lives with each other. But, you know, we find out that they are having three babies. Because one, she remember, she put in two of them. She put two embryos in. Well, one of them split, forming identical twins. And then there's a solo baby by themselves. And, and then when they said three, I'm like, damn, three? I'm like, I definitely don't think y'all ready for that. I mean, because y'all are, like I said, they have three. She has three kids already of her own. And then <laughs> y'all got three more? That's six mouths to feed, plus you two. That means you got to get a, and like the daddy, because they told her dad and the kids, that they told the kids and her dad that she was pregnant, and Shane told the dad that there was three. And I agree with the dad. Shane needs to get a job, number one, but I mean, in this in this climate right now, where we're in, it might not be the easiest thing to do, but um, I didn't realize that that was up so high. But yeah. I think they should have, I think Lacey, if they were going to have a baby, she should have just did the one embryo. And if it took, cool. If not, you still have another one that's frozen. I think Lacey was just, a, and I'm going to be honest, I think with this one, she was just a little bit irrational. But nonetheless, congratulations to them. I hope, you know, I did see in the, at the end of the episode that they told us, that what is it four months or four days it's somewhere around the time that she is due that john is getting out of jail i'm like y'all are messy as fuck um yeah let's move on all right you guys and then let's wrap the episode up with angela and tony these two actually kind of got him under his a little bit just a little bit so you know tony you know he's still upset about the fact that angela they got married, but she didn't file the marriage license. You know, she didn't file for the marriage license, or she didn't. She didn't go to the courthouse to make the marriage legal. And he finds out that she's going on a date because he's been talking to Tommy. So he pulled up at the house, and he had the audacity to go to her door and tell her, Angela, open the fucking door. I was like, oh, okay, Tony. You think you got it like that? And then she says, Tony, what do you want? What do you want, Tony? So Tony comes in, she's like, God, do you ever quit? So he comes in, he says that he's been talking to Tommy, and he Tommy told her that she's seen another car. And and um, you know, um, he asked her about seeing the anime. She said, That's none of your business, Tony. Which you are correct, Angela. That is absolutely none of his motherfucking business. So, you know, um, she does tell him about Ross. <laughs> the thing that I found funny with Tony was 
the fact that he called her trifling. Now I would have I would have been I would have been okay with him if he had just called her a hypocrite, but this motherfucker actually called her trifling. No, you the trifling one. I'm actually defending Angela, and I can't even believe this, but you the trifling one because you're the one that was at the hotel with the prostitutes and the hookers doing drugs. So you're the trifling one. Is Angela a hypocrite? One hundred percent. You know, Angela was talking about she wasn't cheating on him. Girl, if it's emotional, it don't ha it don't have to be physical to be cheating. You can have an emotional affair, and that's what you were doing with Mr. Ross. When Tony fucks up, you go run to Ross. So yes, you are a hypocrite. Live in it. Now the one thing that I do want to say, because I kept looking at her trailer and I kept looking at that door. That door was throwing me the fuck off. That door looked so terrible and disgusting. I'm like, Angela, you really need to upgrade your trailer. Like, it's time to upgrade that trailer because it just looks disgusting. So she tells, also tells Tony, I love Ross. And we are, we're not together anymore. It's over, Tony. He says, I love you, okay? And I'm not going to stop chasing you. I'm like, oh God. She says, I'm emotionally, I'm emotionally drained from you and all of your bullshit, Tony. I'm like, yeah, Angela, we see it all over your face that you're emotionally drained from Tony. I'm emotionally drained from you and Tony at this point. You both get on my mother in nerves. And later in the episode, you know, Tony tries to call Angela on the phone. She keeps in, you know, she keeps declining the the his phone calls. And, you know, she got another phone call, and this time it was from Mr. Ross, who got his ass in jail because he said the cops beat him up, but they said that he attacked them. I'm like, oh, God. You were high, obviously. I was thinking he was going to say they got him for that gun, but nope, that's not what they got him for. And she tells him, um, <clears throat> what the hell, Ross? What the hell? You got to get your shit together. Angela, you got to get your shit together, too. Why do you keep choosing these damn inmates that keep going? You know, that's one thing that I got to say. I don't understand inmates. Once you get out of jail, like I know some of them who get out of jail and they go right back. What you going back for? Like, I feel like the niggas or people and men in general who go back to prison, you left your boyfriend down there, huh? Because I, I, I can't understand that shit. But you guys, that is going to wrap it up for this episode of Life After Lockup. Be sure to like this video, leave your comments, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell notification button so you guys are aware of when I drop anything else. Share this video, and until the next one, you guys, do me a solid favor out there. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Stay hydrated. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. And um, I will see you guys in the next one. Also, you guys, I am going to go ahead and do this. I am plugging my other YouTube channel that I have on here. It is um, a planner channel that I'm doing. I have my planner. It's actually sitting right on the floor. I'm going to start planning. It's going to be kind of um, Actually, shout out to my um, good sister, Roxanne. She is the reason that I'm back into planning. I used to do planning when I was in college. But yeah, you guys, go check out my planner channel. There's nothing up there yet. But going into October, with October, I'm going to start planning. Because I told myself that I'm going to start to plan for my GMAT test that I intend to take sometime by the end of the year. So check that out, you guys. Um, yeah, check that out. Check that out. I'll leave this in the description. It'll be in the description as well. Um, but the name of my channel is Jerome's Planet. So J-E-R-O-M-E, Plan It. Go check it out. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.